invite you to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, on this World Communion Sunday, as we read the ancient words of Scripture, by your Holy Spirit, may they come alive in our hearing. May we understand your message of love for the world in which we inhabit. And may we hear within that message your love for us, each and all. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to scripture as I read it to you from the third chapter of the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to John. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into his mother's wombs and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> a week or two ago, I was having a really rough day. Nothing horrible, but just one of those days where all the little tasks seemed to pile up on me. There were more emails than I could answer. My cell phone kept ringing with a host of different things and reminders, text messages, and then the office phone too all demanding my attention. I remember when I got home that evening, I was muttering under my breath about a difficult day I had, and of course was looking for sympathy and understanding from my wife, Karen. Well, it seems that she too had a tough day, sorting through medical bills, calling insurance companies, trying to get things straightened out, and laying the groundwork for our eventual retirement. And so both of us commiserated about how life seems to be getting tougher and tougher, more complicated, more demanding, and more tiring. And in the course of our little whining session, Carrie remarked, you know, sometimes this is a difficult and unforgiving world. A difficult and unforgiving world. At times it does seem like a difficult, hard and unforgiving world, not just on the bad days. You know, think about it. This is a world where natural disasters strike without warning. This is a world where human cruelty often reigns, where people are persecuted because of their beliefs, their ethnic heritage, or their place of birth. This is a world with bullying and cruelty. This is a world that is encroaching on any type of solitary time we might have or need. 
from cell phones and text messages, email and the like, constantly bombarding us, demanding our attention and our time. Where can you get away? Where? You know, this is a world that is filled with anger and with rage, with demanding people. And there are days when the sun doesn't come out, literally and figuratively. It is a difficult and hard world at times. Christ proclaimed in John's Gospel to Nicodemus that this world, this world, the world I just spoke of, is the world that God loves. God so loved this world with all its imperfections, with all its craziness, with all its demands, with all its evil. God so loved this world that he gave his only son for its salvation. God loves this world. And God chooses not to condemn it, not to ignore it, not to destroy it. God loves this world so much that God has chosen in his freedom to rescue it, to save it. Now, this is the message I have for this morning, this World Communion morning. I'm going to talk about this world because it is World Communion. You see, this world that you and I inhabit, this world that sometimes weighs heavily upon us, this world that often seems hard and unforgiving, is the object of God's love. God has not abandoned this world, and neither should we. And so I have three points I want to make. First, God's love for this world. Second, how we can go about loving what God loves. And third, how we can love the world without being consumed by it, without becoming overly worldly. Let's take them one at a time. God so loved this world. I think there's a tendency within Christian faith to spiritualize the message of the gospel. And certainly there is a spiritual message. It's there in the passage I just read to you. But the core message of the Bible is addressed to living in this world, how we live within this world. You know, from the opening verses of the Bible, we read that God created this world. The material world did not exist until it was created by God. And after God created it, what did he call it? He called it good. And what's the Hebrew word for good? It is tov. Which means that it's not only, hey, that's a cool world. No, it means it's a good world, ethically good, that it's morally righteous, that it contains the stuff of goodness. The primary message of the New Testament is that God in Jesus Christ became flesh, became part of this world. You know, the hope that we declare on Easter at our funerals and at memorial services is the resurrection of the body, not the immortality of the spirit. You know, Hellen Hellenistic philosophy, from Socrates and Plato to the Stoics, denigrated things material in favor of the ideal and the spiritual. But Christian faith is not Greek philosophy. We believe that God created the world and that it's God's world and it's a good world. And we believe that God created human beings and God loves them. We believe that God became flesh and assumed a material existence among us. You see, the fundamental difference between Christianity and the Eastern religions is that we are called to love this world to live within this world, and to transform this world. Not deny the world, not trying to escape the world. Christian faith takes seriously the world God created. It's not merely a faith that declares, oh, we'll get pie in the sky by and by. No, it's a faith that proclaims the value of this world and the value of the creatures who inhabit it, including you and me. It proclaims salvation for the whole person, body and soul. Why do you think Jesus healed people? 
Why do you think Presbyterians throughout our history have established hospitals for the healing of people? Because we are concerned about people, body and soul, because they are the ones whom God loves. The gospel proclaims this salvation in the present moment also. You'll remember that when Jesus hung upon the cross, he said to the criminal next to him, this day you will be in paradise with me. Jesus not only proclaimed the kingdom of heaven, but he also taught us to pray, saying, Thy kingdom come where on earth as it is in heaven. In this world, God so loved this world. Our challenge, of course, is loving that which God loves. Ooh. Just of course here. I love fishing. Some of you know that. I just love fishing. And oftentimes, Karen or my daughter will join me when I am fishing. I know, I know that they are not crazy about it. And they can probably take it or leave it, mostly leave it. But they come along and they enjoy themselves. And I finally figured out why. Because they like me. They love me. <laughs> That's one of the qualities of love. We learn to love those things that our loved ones hold dear. We learn to love those things that our loved ones hold dear. God so loved the world. We love God and are called to love this world because God loves it. We're called to love what God regards as precious, what God gave his son for to save. We're called to be good stewards of this creation, to take care of God's world because God loves it. Think about it. If someone lent you a prized possession, a classic car, nice boat, or something that was very valuable to them, would you abuse it? How would they feel if you turned it back in with a fender dented. You know, God has placed us on this earth and we are entrusted with something that is absolutely precious to God. And so I ask again, how can we abuse, pollute, destroy, hurt, injure, and or desecrate that which God loves so much? God so loved this world. The danger, of course, is being consumed by it, by the world. How do we love God's world, God's creation, without becoming worldly? I think this is the challenge that Christians face. You know, we often substitute ownership and control for loving. You know, love is a relationship. Ownership and control I believe, is the antithesis of a relationship. You see, when we love another, that love does not manifest itself in controlling behavior. Nor do we own someone when we love them. Loving the world that God loves, I think, involves the following. First, it involves the recognition that we do not own this world. I got up this morning. I put on my clothes, drank my coffee, read my paper, got in my car, came to my office. My, 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 mine. No. The psalmist declared the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I think loving the world involves relinquishing ownership from, of it. Second, loving the world requires care. We don't abuse that which we love. We don't neglect that which we love. God created this world and all that is in it, including humanity. I think loving God's world is a recognition that we are called to care for it and to care for all people who are in it. It's also a recognition that our sister and our, that we are indeed our sister and our brother's keeper even when we don't like them. 
They're part of a world, the world that God loves. Third, loving the world is a recognition that we are but sojourners in this world. We're passing through. We're passing through. We're here to enjoy it, knowing also that we will leave it and others will follow and we must leave this world to them. God so loved the world. I think the challenge of Christian faith is to learn to love this world the way that God loves it without becoming worldly. Amen.